John Cooper Millenkamp once wrote a song called Being Born in a Small Town, a Small Community, and that he could not forget where it was that he came from. Those words are still pretty true today as we think about small towns that have a big impact. Some of the words, I was born in a small town, I live in a small town, probably died in a small town. Oh, those small communities. All my friends are small town. My parents live in the same small town. My job is small town, provides a little opportunity. Educated in a small town, taught to fear Jesus in a small town. Small towns. They have big impact. Benton, Mississippi, I kid you not, is a really small town. Smaller than Chunky. Very small. But it was once the seat for Yazoo County. That is, it was once the capital for Yazoo County. It's also the location where, for better or for worse, depending on what side of history you come down on, where Senator Jefferson Davis had first suggested secession leading to the war between the states. Canton, Mississippi is a little bit more of a medium town now. It was small at one time, but it's grown over the years. Its history starts around 1836, and I'm not going to bore you with history today. Well, maybe not too much. However, they were once occupied by General Grant and the house that was one of his headquarters, and I think served as a hospital. It was uh, where my grandmother lived, I was in walking distance of that house. It was an amazing place to live. And they're famous now for being the city of lights. If you go during the holidays, or the biannual flea market, uh, once in the spring, once in the fall. But Chunky, Mississippi is a small town. According to Terry Lane, and I quote, Chunky has roots in the village of Chunkyville, located a few miles south of the town of Chunky. Chunkyville was established prior to 1848 on the grounds of a large Choctaw village called Chunky Chitto, once located on the west bank of the Chunky River. Chunky Chitto was home of the most prominent Indian sports field in East Mississippi. Here the Choctaws played Chunky, a game played with spears and perfectly round polished stones. End quote. I find that amazing. Bethlehem is a small town with a big impact, in fact, an eternal impact. And today I hope that we were going to see three points. First of all, Bethlehem's place in history. Then Bethlehem's place in his story. And then Bethlehem's place in your story. As we think about Bethlehem this morning, it is the place where the promise of hope and heaven is revealed to a dark world. Bethlehem, in its place in history, you have your Bibles turned with me to Micah, chapter 5, reading verses 2 and 4. Micah, in the Old Testament, chapter 5, 2 and 4. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up unto the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. So Bethlehem has an ancient um, designation. It's called Bethlehem Ephratah, or Ephratah. depends on how you want to pronounce that. And that word Ephratah uh, is a very special term. It's the ancient name for the village, the little town that we sing about, how silently we see you sleep. And it is the word for fruitful. Bethlehem is associated, as the picture that you see uh, on the screen, it is associated with, obviously, fields where they had grain production, barley, all those things, because bread is an important uh, aspect of one's diet. 
also fields for herds and flocks and, and other, because they're not far from being uh, outside the city of Jerusalem. So they're supplying many of the sheep and other animals that are used in temple sacrifice. So it is a very fruitful place. And the reason that Micah says Bethlehem Ephratah is because there is another Bethlehem located up in the region of Galilee. And so Micah, by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, is zeroing it down. He's not just being general and, okay, a 50-50 chance of hitting it in the dark. He is being very precise. Bethlehem, Ephrata. It is significant. It is prophetic. The ancient name may well belong to the clan in which Obed and Jesse and obviously King David uh, are members uh, from the tribe of Judah. Eprata uh, is a designation then of royal, uh, royal pedigree associated with King David. David uh, grew up raising his father's sheep in the back 40 of Bethlehem. Very, very amazing. 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. Luke 2, 4. So Joseph also went up from Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem since he was of the house and line, that is family tree, of David. It's also the term Bethlehem is itself important. I'll give you a quick word study. The word Beth is usually broken down as Bayith, and it means house, um, loosely, okay? And then the last part of that, Lachem, which we pronounce it in English as Bethlehem. Lachem means, of course, obviously, uh, <coughs> the uh, bread. Again, associated with grain. Know that in the house of bread is born the one who is the bread of life. And that is as true today on December the 24th, 2023, as it is any other time. Bethlehem has an ancient description. It says, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, you know, small town, small community. Bethlehem is small, but not insignificant. It has a big history. It is the burial place of Rachel, if you remember from your Old Testament reading, uh, Rachel is the one of two wives, well actually he had four, but I won't get into all the details, but he had two official wives and he had two concubines, but uh, uh, two of his wives, the, the one that was his favorite wife was Rachel, and it is there where she, well in the area outside of Bethlehem, it is there where she is buried. It has a very special place. The Bible says in Genesis 48, 7, as for me, when I came from Padam, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath, the same as Bethlehem. It is also in that same little town, that little small community, where Boaz will redeem Ruth because her husband is dead. <coughs> And there's no one to raise up a child in the husband's name. So uh, he will perform the duty that was part of the, the Jewish custom. He will, he will take Ruth to be his wife. And it's a beautiful love story of redemption. I challenge you to read it sometime because it mirrors what Christ has done for his church. And by taking her to be his wife, their firstborn son will begin that lineage that will be leading to not only King David, but also to Jesus. Therefore, Joseph is of the house and lineage of David. He also restores to Naomi, his mother-in-law, who she said, don't call me Naomi Pleasant, call me Mara. Bitter, because I'm bitter with God, and I'm bitter with life, and I'm in resentful of the situation. That's exactly how she felt. And now that she holds her, her grandson that she thought she would never, ever get to see, she holds a grandson who represents the future, and now she is in every aspect of that word, Naomi, pleasant, because of the grace of God. And the Bible tells us we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah, 
and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Ruth chapter 4, 11 and 12. Sadly, it is also in Bethlehem, Ephrata, where Jeremiah sees a tragedy in which he says, in essence, uh, Rachel, uh, there is lamentation that is heard in Ramah. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are no more. And that is fulfilled when King Herod, in an effort to, to kill the Christ child, the Messiah, sends his troops into Bethlehem, slaying the children two years old and younger. That is a place of tragedy. So Bethlehem has a history about it. Bethlehem is small, but not inconsequential. For it is here that Micah says the not only the deliverer of the Hebrew people, but ultimately the Savior of the world is to be born, whose birth we are celebrating tonight and tomorrow. As we think about that, the Bible reminds us, there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. If not only does Bethlehem have an ancient uh, designation and an ancient description, it's also, it was an ancestral destination. <coughs> Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? John 7, 42. Which is why Joseph and Mary had to go. They didn't just decide as she is along with child to, hey, let's go to Bethlehem. Just kind of check out the sights. You know, Nazareth has kind of gotten a little, a little stuffy. So we're going to go there for a while. No, uh, they would probably prefer to stay in the hometown. But because of Caesar Augustus issuing this decree that you must go and be counted for the purposes of taxation without representation probably, uh, you must go to your ancestral home. For me, it would be Canton, Mississippi. For some of you, it may be some other places. For some, it might be New Orleans. For others, it could be halfway around the world. Good luck, okay? But anyway, so there, he has to go because Joseph definitely can trace his family line back to that of King David. Although the family line of King David is not in power uh, at that time. Dr. John Scott says that he was determined, that is Joseph, not to leave Mary behind. Because that's his wife. And both are acutely aware that the child that she bears is of a supernatural conception. It is not just a run-of-the-mill average pregnancy. This is something special. And they have been both informed by the angels about that, the angel Gabriel specifically. And as a result, they are going to do everything they can to be in line with what Scripture has called. And they do so. Dr. John MacArthur says that the trip is about 70 miles would have been over perilous and difficult mountainous and rough terrain. Often, we do not give Mary the credit that she deserves. Sometimes some people give more credit than she needs to have. And then on, as a reaction, some people deny anything about Mary whatsoever. Uh, somewhere in between must be reality. We don't give her the proper credit many times that she was willing as a young teenage girl to risk life and limb so that she could serve the Lord her God. The Bible reminds us that Bethlehem was divinely determined. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Galatians 4, 4 through 5. Paul eminently sums it up quite theologically for us. However, let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and 7. And it came to pass in those days. What days? The fullness of the time that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was. That while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. 
And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Supply that this morning as we think about Bethlehem and its place in history. First of all, as we are thinking of that, Bethlehem Ephrata was meant to bear much fruit for God as part of His plan for salvation. And it did so. And the implication for you and for me this morning is that we may be little, but we're not inconsequential. And we're not insignificant in the eyes of God. None of us in this room are. And no one in this community is insignificant or inconsequential. While we're little, we are of great value to God. And by His grace, we can and we will bear much fruit for Him. Will you trust Him this morning to help you bear that fruit? Just as Bethlehem was fruitful, will you trust Him in this coming year to help you be fruitful? As I said, in the house of bread was born the one who is the bread of life. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. John 6, 35. So have you tasted of this bread of heaven? The one that has the power to satisfy your soul. Remember that his story touches you and your story here and now. Let's move on to another section. As we think about Bethlehem and its place in history, now we look at Bethlehem and its place in his story. Not just history, but his story. <clears throat> Bethlehem is the place of promise. It is the promise of heaven. At Bethlehem, the prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Micah are perfectly and literally fulfilled. God is not just all general, but quite specific and spectacular. And so Jesus is given his name, which is Yeshua in the Hebrew. Jesus meaning he shall save his people from their sins. That he is the living embodiment of what salvation and therefore eternal life is. The very promise of heaven because God desires a personal relationship with you this morning. Not just back then, not just sometime out here in the future, but right here and right now. He desires that personal relationship with you. And in the person of Jesus, born at Bethlehem Ephrathah, that is a possibility. That can be reality for you today. It is the very promise of heaven. But it's also, number two, the promise of hope. Hebrews knew nothing but oppression for a long time. And Jesus came to be their deliverer. He is a very Jewish Jesus. I said that in class one time. Uh-uh, Brother Moore, he's Christian. I just wanted to just bang my head on the wall there for a minute. But anyway, I'm like, he was Jewish. Christ is his title for Messiah, which is Jewish. And he was also for all the world. And then the light bulb came on. And, and of course, we all rejoiced on that. But I'm thinking, okay, that was one of those moments However, when we think about that, Jesus came to be your deliverer. There may be something that you need delivering from. We live in an age of oppression, not just because of the government or because of other things, but we live in an age where there can be oppression by uh, other forces. We are under the oppressiveness of sin, and Jesus came to deliver us from that. Humanity felt the oppression of sin then, and I promise you, look on the news, humanity feels the oppression of sin today. And Jesus came to put away sin and to bridge the gap between God and man. For the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, and that is the free gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And it also says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Chapter, 
2 Corinthians 5, 17. That is the beauty of what we get to be and do as Chunky Baptist Church in a small town. We are agents of hope. We are ministers, every one of us, of reconciliation. Whatever that might need to be for different people, you and I, by the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit living inside of us, get to be that because Jesus was born of the Virgin died on the cross paying the penalty and price for our sin, who rose from the dead and who is coming again one day. See, that's what Christmas is about. Not just the baby in the manger, although that is a very awesome moment. But it's all leading to that. Bethlehem is the place of peace. Peace with God. Jesus came to establish peace with God. He brought two sides who were at war. God is angry with the wicked every day. And yet, he also is compassionate, loving, and merciful. So how do you bridge that gap? Jesus. Jesus came. And by his death, his being sinless, that's why he has no biological father, but he had a biological mother, so he's completely 100% human, but he's also completely 100% God. Not a little bit of both, but 100% on both sides. He was able to pay the price and established peace. He brought both sides that had been alienated since Genesis chapter 3 together. The Bible says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 1. What a beautiful message of Christmas. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. Again, a beautiful message of Christmas, and if we have peace with God, then we can help others in this small town and in this small community know peace with God as well. You and I get to be agents of peace. There's also the peace of God. Once there's peace with God, then you can begin to know and experience the peace of God. For the King of Kings is the divine Prince of Peace. He is the producer and the promoter of peace in every shape, form, and fashion of that word, that, that state of being. That's what in, in the Hebrew, shalom, you've heard that before. Okay, that's peace, peace be to you. That word is a sense of being, not just something that, oh, we feel great. I mean, I feel pretty good this morning. I don't know about you. I hope you all feel great this morning. Some of you may be getting over colds and flu. I hope you feel better. But no, that's not the peace that I'm talking about. But having that sense of God's presence, knowing that if all else falls to the ground, <laughs> crashes and burns, that our joy in the Lord is secure. Our hope is secure. Our eternal destination with Him is secure. That is the peace of God. So like Job, he can say, though he slay me, yet I will trust in Him. That is peace with God, and that is peace of God this morning. The Bible reminds us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Canton is a small town. Always will be, in my opinion, although it has extended its borders many times since I lived there. But I grew up there. That is where I was born. I was raised there. I went to, to school there. I, went to, I graduated high school there. That is where, literally, I came to know Christ as Lord and Savior. I was baptized there. Uh, for a long time, I worked uh, at a nursing home and hospital right there in the small town of Camden. It is there where much of my family lies buried. So yes, uh, you know, Canton will always hold some special connection there. It was there where I was married. It was there where uh, I left to, with my wife to go to New Orleans and, and beginning of the ministry that has led us here. So yes, I'm grateful to God for small towns. And I'm grateful for God for the small town of Chunky that has big potential in Jesus Christ. As we apply this this morning, you can have peace with God because of the birth of the Prince of Peace at Bethlehem at Pratah. It begins by personally putting your trust in Bethlehem's most famous son, not King David, but King Jesus. Have you done that 
If not, why not make it today? Why not experience the true gift that keeps on giving and come to this altar in just a moment and say, Lord Jesus, save me. I, I, turn, I turn to you. Save me. You can have peace of God because of Jesus. Surrender to Him. Submit to Him. Those are words we don't like to use, but absolutely necessary. Sometimes we try to go our own way. Sometimes we try to do it uh, in ways that we think are great when God says, no, uh, I don't want you to go your way, Charles. I want you to go my way. When you go my way, we walk side by side, lockstep. Then you will have that peace. So if everything else falls apart, it will be fine. Sometimes we have to just come to the altar and say, Lord, I just, I need you. I'm saved. I just, I need you. And I want to know that peace that you give. And last but not least, we look at Bethlehem's. We looked at its place in history. We have looked briefly at its place in his story. Now let's close by looking at Bethlehem's place in your story. Whosoever. You and I are among the whosoever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And who said that the Gospel of John did not have any type of Christmas reference? Love gives. God loved. God gave. Have you received it? And then as we think about that, there's another question. Why not now? I've already alluded to it, but why not now? When Jesus was born at Bethlehem, the angels proclaimed his birth. They glorified God. Shepherds uh, saw that and they were invited to go to Bethlehem, to come to the manger and, and to check it out, to see for themselves. And I want you to know that they immediately obeyed. They said, let us go and see that this thing that the angels have said. They did not debate it. They did not discuss it. They didn't form a committee and study it. They didn't hem haw around. I don't know. It's just... We've got we to walk all the way over there. How many times have we denied a, ourselves a blessing from the Lord or have we denied others a blessing from God because you and I were unwilling to go check it out and be used to God in that moment? Because after they saw what the angels had said was true, they went and told others, becoming agents of hope, agents of peace, exhibiting the joy of the Lord. So like them, you and I can know what makes for peace right here and now. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of your sins, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing through the word of God, Romans 10.17. Hear God's word speak to you. It may originate in terms of the story of the, of the Messiah in Micah. But it is fresh as the newborn and it is fresh as the fallen snow if we were to have snow outside, mainly going to rain. But you get the point. It's fresh for you. He says, in the acceptable time, I listen to you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the time of favor or grace. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6.2. So we apply this. As we think about that invitation, the most important moment of this worship service is what you do with the Lord your God. What do you do with the child of Bethlehem who's no longer a child but the king of kings? Whatever it is that you need to do and whatever it is that you want to do with Jesus, there's no time like the present Come adore him. Come and act today. Maybe your story needs hope. He's full of hope. Life, love, and abundance. Your story is not written yet. So trust him who is the author and finisher to fill in the blanks and the gaps that may be in your life this Christmas. Bethlehem was indeed a special place Revealing the promise of hope in heaven for a dark world. Bethlehem made its mark on history because of his story. But has his story made its mark on your story? As we stand and sing our hymn of invitation this morning, as our worship leaders come, I invite you to come. Yes, there's room. I will be more than happy to get out of the way. You come and do business with Jesus this morning.